Good evening. It is October 24th, 2024, and this is a meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Working Group. Um, I am Jim Richards, and I am not on this committee. However, I will be uh, facilitating for this evening since uh, Sarah is um, Sarah Robinson is unavailable this evening. She's out of town. So please bear with me as I only found out I was doing this a short time ago. But uh, let's kick off by uh, first going uh, through the members of this committee. Uh, Nicole Fox is here. Elizabeth Leahy is here. Molly Swanson. Nope. Uh, but she's still on the committee. Christine Young. Good to see you, Christine. Uh, Liz Tardungo. Tardungo. She did send. Oh, she wasn't okay, able to Okay, not going to be able to make it tonight. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, mentioned, Sarah Robinson is uh, the board member on this. Uh, we also have Matt Cashman, Carrie Crotty, and uh, Superintendent Murphy with us this evening. Um, as well as uh, Tina and Bobby from HMFH. So, uh, did, did you miss somebody? I don't know. I don't yeah. have anybody. Do I have anybody? Uh, Not Corey. 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 I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, and it's right here. Sorry. Corey <laughs> Spedalunas. Corey's down there. <laughs> Very good. Sorry. My apologies. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody knows each other. Or do you want to have a brief introduction? Let's start with a brief introduction. I'm Jim Richards. I'm on the school board. I'm on the building committee. I'm not on this committee, but I am on the building committee. Um, and so, if you want to. Sure. Um, I'm Christine Young. Um, I live on Mountain Road. I've got one kid in fourth grade and two younger ones who are currently in a private school. Um, so just wanted to get involved and be a part of this process here. Thank you. Great. Nicole? Uh, I'm Nicole Fox. Um, I'm a parent of three students in the school district, one at Runlet currently, um, and I'm on the building committee, and I'm a transportation engineer. Um, I'm Terry Wolf. I'm director of communications for the district, and I get to attend all the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a Terry. My last name is Crotty, and I'm the director of transportation for the Concord School District. Uh, and I'm Tina Stanislavski. I'm the principal in charge from HMFH, and we are the architects working on the project. Yep. And I'm Bobby Williams from HMFH. I'm the project manager. Um, Corey Spedalinus. I am a safety project manager for the New Hampshire DOT, um, and also father to two children in the district. School district. I'm Elizabeth Leahy. I also live on Mountain Road, and I have one daughter who goes to Broken Ground. Hmm. And I'm Matt Cashman, director of facilities and planning. Like Terry and Kathleen, I attend all the meetings as well for this project. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Kathleen Murphy, Superintendent of Schools. And, and Terry, sorry I omitted you, but you're at all the meetings. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to thank everyone for your participation on this group. It's um, very important. It is definitely uh, something that um, traffic and transportation at all our schools is something that I am very concerned about and always very interested in. So I look forward to having a very productive and a good committee. Um, unless anybody has anything else, I will pass this on to HMFH for their presentation for this evening. So we wanted to just start off with a overview of the site. Um, I, everybody's probably already seen it, but I just want to make sure you understand our plans for the new site. So, oops, sorry. So this is the Broken Ground School in Millbrook down here, um, and this is Portsmouth. So right now we're proposing that all the parents are coming in for drop off and pick up off of Portsmouth. Um, and they're dropping off here at this front plaza that we've created for the school. Um, this is also the way that uh, teachers will come in and park, and there'll be visitor parking in this zone. Um, and we've separated parent drop-off from the bus drop-off for safety. And so buses will be the ones that are coming down South Curtisville, and they will enter the site here after the Millbrook um, driveway and make their way up to this loop here, and they will drop off at the same plaza as the parents. So everybody's coming in and out this front door altogether. 
Um, there's also the fields back here behind the school, and there's a lot inside this bus drop-off for overflow parking. Um, this could probably be used, you know, on weekends if people are coming to games or they're gonna hike the trails, this will be open. Um, there's also a loop road around the school for fire safety, emergency vehicles. Um, services will start, will come in off of this road as well, and the loading dock is back here. So and then they'll turn around and go back out this way. So any sort of deliveries will come in that way. Um, the goal is probably to have this road, you know, shut down during the school day. We might, we might gate it. Obviously, emergency vehicles would have access to it. Um, but that's the plans for right now. Any questions on the overall layout? Okay. Thank you. So we just wanted to first start with that overall. Um, but tonight we wanted to first, oops, sorry, let me get this set here. My mouse is a little bit wonky. Um, we wanted to start with just a, an overview of the traffic study that happened and all the different intersections that were studied, some of the preliminary findings. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about sidewalks um, and, and safe routes to school. Um, there's a site circulation and hiking trails we'll talk about. So some of what we just showed you, that slide will pop back up and we'll just get into it a little bit more. Um, and then Terry Crotty is going to talk a little bit about general transportation. And then also as part of the traffic study, the um, school board asked us to look at Millbrook and Broken Ground and traffic solutions for that school. That's not part of this project, but we want to kind of give you an update on what was found and kind of the next steps on that piece. That door shut. Yeah, he's just going to turn it off. <laughs> um, so from a high level here, we're looking at, this is uh, zooming out now. I can maybe zoom in to help you out. This is the Broken Ground and Millbrook School. So the traffic study, so. uh, I'm sorry, my mouse is doing some wonky stuff tonight. Um, the traffic study looked at all these intersections. This was um, a meeting that we had early with the city and kind of asked them for their, um, their requirements of what they would like us to look at. It also included um, the I-393 ramps, um, both, both ways. Um, however, we'll talk about how uh, those are the New Hampshire DOT jurisdiction and with the larger project coming through, we've kind of provided our, our data to them. Um, so again, in looking at this, this is South Curtisville Road in Mobrook School. So there were the, this was that, where we're gonna talk about the end here, which is these three kind of ins and outs to the school. Um, we looked at South Curtisville Road and Portsmouth Street and Broken Ground Drive. So that's this one and this one. Um, we looked at East Side Drive um, and Portsmouth Street, which is here. And then also South Curtisville, East Side Drive, and East Side Drive and Broken Ground Drive. Zooming in on the four way intersection here. Um, they did traffic counts. They, they get one more in here. I don't know why this isn't working. One more person. How are you doing? <laughs> um, so the South Curtisville Road and Portsmouth Street. Uh, there was no significant findings here. Um, they noticed motorist compliance when there wasn't anybody around. They would sometimes roll through the stop signs. Um, but they did say that the visibility of the stop signs were not significant. So some of their recommendations were um, adding LED lights within the border of the stop signs to enhance vision. So it's just bringing more awareness to this four-way stop. Um, it, it, it is something they said during school hours when it was um, a little bit more congested that people did obey the law. So they didn't see any significant motor vehicle um, issues with this one. Um, but they did also recommend that perhaps striping the South Curtisville a center lane in South Curtisville would help with just directing traffic because it is a little bit of a wider road. So it would just give traffic a little bit more direction. So um, there wasn't any significant findings on, on this street with the traffic. And I think that there's actually like a pilot program to add those flashing stop signs already going on in the city. So, um, you know, we, when we talk to them, when we submit to the planning board, this may be something that they put into their like pilot program to add the flashing stop signs here. Okay, uh, moving over to East Side Drive and Portsmouth Street. Um, 
again, nothing significant here except for restricted sight lines due to vegetation. So trimming and clearing vegetation to improve sight lines was the recommendations. And there's pictures of some of this stuff in the copy of the traffic study. So after the meeting or later, you can kind of thumb through that and see those. Um, East Side Drive and South Curtisville Road. Um, South <laughs> Curtisville Road, during uh, peak hours, they were looked at so that it might um, experience operational issues when they were looking at potential traffic counts that could happen there. So they did a, a traffic analysis warrant and they study the traffic analysis warrants, they study um, different years in the future and they escalate traffic to what they think. And it did indicate that in the year 2038 um, that this, this intersection um, warranted a signal. So, you know, one of the recommendations is um, potentially putting a signal in here down the road or I mean, you can put it in early, but if you, it, it's not warranted potentially until 2038. All of these recommendations will go to the planning board too when we meet with them and then we'll get feedback from the city at that point in time. So we'll find out how they feel about, you know, the year 2038 and how we're going to handle that. That's a great point, Tina. This is all just giving you the information and then we, we present this to the planning board and, and come up. So thank you. Um, moving down to broken ground, again, restricted sight lines due to vegetation. Um, so trimming and clearing is important, but they did recommend that potentially restricting the left turn um, from here to control the traffic more so more people use that intersection. That would be South Curtisville and Eastside Drive. So you don't have people, you know, trying to cut through a, if, if, if traffic was backed up here, you don't have people taking shortcuts through broken ground and, and going really quick. So they would try to restrict maybe a left turn lane during hours or altogether. And I think that had to do with the signal as well. So if you put that in place and there's no left turns there, that helps with the warrant for the signal at South Curtisville as well. So it helps to build up those, those numbers. Um, and then the East Side Drive, I-393 westbound ramps and uh, eastbound ramps. <coughs> so at the request of the city, we did turn over the qualitative data that was studied there, all the traffic counts um, because of that larger project. And because this is a New Hampshire DOT jurisdiction, um, future, future use uh, and future updates would go through New Hampshire DOT, so. So, so our data was given over to both the city and the Department of Transportation? Uh, I believe just New Hampshire DOT. I okay. don't think it was okay. for the city. I think that it was when we had a conversation with the city, it was when we were just kind of asking things, they had said, oh, there's more study. My understanding is there was more study happening at New Hampshire DOT, and they asked if we would share the data, and we did. And it's as it relates to that intersection coming off of 393? Correct. Okay. And I've seen them out there already. They're doing work out there. Are is they that doing right? Work? I believe I've seen them out okay. there, yeah. That would make sense. Okay. okay. But again, because there's a, a larger yeah, that project that's sense. coming in and happening, so. Great. Um, when it comes to sidewalks, we just wanted to uh, make everyone aware of the City of Concord Pedestrian Master Plan that was put out in March of 2017. Um, this shows their master plan for the whole city and where they're planning on adding sidewalks. Um, so we, we just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention. And that's something you can find on their website. So you can pull that up if you want to look at anything more in detail. It's on the city's website. Can, can you just go over it for us, though? What, what are those red dots? Is that all the oh, sidewalks? Yeah, so now, right, mo yeah. Yeah, so okay. moving on to this Thank slide, um, we wanted to just show everybody all the roads um, around the school that already have sidewalks. Um, these were, were also looked at in the traffic study. Um, and the main um, issue was found at South Curtisville and Eastside Drive, where the uh, intersections are not fully ADA compliant. Um, one of the crosswalks leads to a grass area before accessing the sidewalk. Um, Can you point to where you are? Oh, sure. So this that is- That would be helpful. Yeah, so this is, again, this is where the traffic signal would be warranted in 2038. Yep. yep. Um, so the crosswalks right now, they're saying there's no posted pedestrian signs. They're missing some of the tactile strips. So if you've ever seen a, a what's called a tip down as you're going in a, an accessible, they have those tactile strips for blind people um, so they understand that they're about to cross a road. Um, so they would recommend that the, the city potentially upgrade the existing pedestrian crossing to be ADA and FHWA compliant. Uh, 
can can you go back one yeah. more time? No um, are there any recommendations for additional sidewalks um, at the, this point? At, not that the traffic study identified in the intersections, because the traffic study was limited sure. to the, these areas. Yeah. Are there any areas that are on the screen that the city is already planning to put sidewalks in on? Or if no. you don't know? Okay. No, because all currently, if you, you can see, all pretty much all yeah. the neighborhoods, other than the, the side neighborhoods here, all the main roads already have sidewalks. So um, as maybe as part of the city, they would look at you know rehabilitating existing okay. sidewalks. Um, but that, that's it out of our purview but again when we go to the planning board and we talk about a new school going in there might be you know discussion around we would like this updated and that updated and i think that's all part of the conversation we'd have with the city and the planning board at that time so so they would ask us to consider those as recommendations yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah because they're identified and it's it's, right. it's a need so when we say side, we have sidewalks does um anything by like both sides of the street or just one side of the street or is it I think it's mainly one side of the street yeah sort of you know the, the idea that master plan like the Mike, one of the things they, oh, oh, sorry. they won't be um, able to to you know both sides because I can imagine you know what does the traffic look like for you know walkers mm -hmm. uh, you know is it too congested with just one side of the street. That'd be a question. Okay. Yeah. So I'll remind um, everyone on the uh, on the committee, uh, since this is the first meeting, is that uh, this meeting is uh, being recorded and potentially streaming out live. I don't know if they're doing that tonight, not, not tonight. but that occa on occasion that is, occurs. But it's being recorded, so please speak into a microphone whenever you can. Um, we all can hear you, but the folks uh, <coughs> in the back. And we'll get you a microphone if you need it. Thank you. And I'll just point out that we're, you know, this, we're getting close to kind of the initial presentation, but we're hoping to have a discussion so we can always flip back and forth to these if we want to ask questions after, but feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation as well. Um, so this is the original slide slides you saw um, when Tina was explaining the circulation. I just want to point out a, a couple of other details here. This long driveway, which is um, was part of what was also identified in the one of the main takeaways from the original traffic study was you need to get cars off the street and buses off the street. That's the number one way to prevent backing up and creating unsafe traffic conditions. So with this design, we have enough queuing all the way around here for the traffic by the time they drop off and then pull back out. Um, it's our understanding we have enough queuing that would take all the cars off the street. So they shouldn't be back up because the cars should be able to get off the street and drive, queue, drop off the kids, and drive out. And the same with the buses. There's enough road here that all the buses, uh, right now there's, there's um, 11 spots here that the buses can sit idle um, and, and actually queue up on. There's more than that if you take into account this um, back part of the road. Um, and even if you wanted to say this is a, a double lane road that a bus can pass another bus So if a bus broke down you have that resiliency to allow buses to pass but um, That was a, one of the goals and, and what this site offered was that long queuing that really helps with traffic back up Now this little marker here is a section marker So what we're doing is we're taking a slice through this and we're looking in that direction and I want to just kind of draw your attention to this conceptual sketch here. So you can see the two 12-foot driving lanes. And then what is proposed is about a five-foot bioswell in between the, the path where students and for safe walking or biking would occur so that there is a barrier between this street and where parents are driving and the, and the walkway to get the students to school. So that's kind of a, a preliminary detail. And again, that was part of the safety concerns just to make sure that when you're having kids walk along the street you know how kids like to run play jump um, having them close to a road where there's a lot of parent traffic is not as safe so that provides that, that safer buffer for that 
Um, the other piece I just wanted to point out, I think Tina mentioned this, you know, um, but this is kind of an overflow parking lot that could be used for the fields. Um, I believe that was already mentioned, but just want to point out again. Um, and the same, the front plaza has enough parking for the entire staff and visitor parking on a daily basis. So the idea again is that um, this is for the parents and staff, and this is for buses during school hours. And then, yeah. Question, uh, I, this is not necessarily a huge use case, but has any thought gotten, gone into like biking? You know, if students or say parents, what would what, what that be considered? You know, how bikes go? Yes, that's a great point. Um, so this front plaza is, I'm sorry, this mouse is just jumping all around. Um, this, this front plaza is, is significantly large and can handle a lot of students, but we would um, propose bike, bike storage and, and locks, or, you know, a bike storage so where you could lock your bike up somewhere in this plaza so that the kids would be able to have that as part of that. Would the bikes enter through the, the car lanes? Um, so if you, if you were to follow this path, if I, go, I can go back here. That section we showed you. Yeah. So oh, that's the sidewalk that goes up that road. So if they the come up Portsmouth, closing. yeah, all the way around here, they can stay on the periphery of the of the cars and then come right into the plaza. So oh, they would never have to cross any traffic. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, and that's again the other finding of the traffic study was it's really important to separate bus and car traffic so you're never mingling. I think if you go to different schools today, you would mm -hmm. see that the bus and cars are mingling, and it always causes a little. Um, congestion and some unsafe conditions so we're trying to be as diligent as possible to make sure that we have the the safest potential drop-off um, that we can make so in looking at your slide that had this bioswale and the little walk um, this one right here yeah. on the uh, walk bike lane that is very similar to what they use in a lot of colleges right now mm -hmm. and uh, I happen to have been on Purdue's campus recently. They use this quite a bit, but they have like a designated either brick or designated area mm -hmm. so that the pedestrians know where the bikes will, and in that case, um, skateboards and you know scooters and everything else use it. Are you planning on using something, utilizing something like that here? Yeah, so the, the path itself right now is 10 feet wide. Right. So I can imagine that, you know, four, or five feet, if you want to go right in the middle, would be striped, mm -hmm. and it would have probably it's the it's the you know most cost effective way to do it is to mm -hmm. stripe it because it would be nice to have the brick and nice change yeah. in, in texture, but that's more cost effect or more costly. So I think we would propose some kind of striping and you know a bike emblem or something on the ground just to okay let Thank people you. know. I mean, the question about the bike lane is an interesting one because if you scroll back out to the neighborhood, there's probably kids coming from the other side where the bus loop is. So we, we'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. So we might want to have a different, you know, so kids don't have to go all I the way read, back out to Portsmouth, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, what you're saying is they could come from like over, like Frost Road in right. that area. And so we don't want them to have to go all the way down no. and around. I Correct. see what you're saying. And, and can we come up with a suggestion for them? Yeah. It's a great idea. I think we should look at it. Right now yeah. there is a proposed sidewalk over there, but it doesn't have the same detail. Where so, are you? Where's that? Um, oh, if, you, if you zoom in, you can kind of see the mm. okay. extra line yep. here. All right. yep. So we are proposing a sidewalk there, Good. so it would have a safe route. Um, it would have buses, not a bunch of cars. So it, you know, maybe you could be, you could just do it right against the street, but that would be something that. Maybe we just make it a little wider there in yeah. a similar mm -hmm. detail so that you could. We'll take a look at it. Yeah. And it's nice. something for this, this committee to talk about and see if it's a priority and something you guys think is necessary. Um, let me see if there's anything else on this. So we zoom in a little bit. Uh, we just wanted to talk a little bit with this about the connecting of the existing trails. So these um, dashed yellow lines are existing trails that come from the end of North Curtisville Road. Um, right now, the, the school is kind of in the middle of where these trails used to navigate through. So there is this um, fire lane that we're proposing that you'd be able to access and walk around to connect back to other trails. And then this one's, these ones are not highlighted, but these are ones that might take you to the other school. 
Um, there was talks about mentoring of the, um, the middle schoolers and the um, elementary school students, so that might be a path that they could, they could take back and forth between the schools. And then if I go back a slide, you know, there, there definitely will be um, ways to connect from the fields more to the other trails there. So again, the idea is that we would mark these and we would make as much effort as possible to reconnect existing paths and find ways for when, when um, residents show up and park that they have a clear designation of how to get to the, the paths and be able to utilize. That is something we, we had definitely heard people were interested in. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. You mentioned the separation of the... Can you do a mic? You mentioned the separation of the car traffic from the bus traffic. Are the start and stop signs from the new middle school going to be different enough from the younger schools that we are not just dramatically worsening the situation at yes. drop off and pick up at Correct. the existing schools? Correct. Um, there, I believe, is a 15-minute buffer between the two. I, I, there are different hours. Oh, no, there's almost an hour. Almost, almost an hour. hour. Yeah. Okay. They start school at 7.30 and... The middle school starts at 8.30. 8.30, mm -hmm. So um, the middle school buses begin, uh, Terry, you can jump in, but it's around 10 of 8. So they're, 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 there's plenty of um, time. And the same in the afternoon, our middle school youngsters um, are dismissed at uh, 3.30. Uh, elementary's at 2.30. Okay. So, yep. so good, good uh, span good. there between them. That, that's As it exists now, question. by the way. That's not anything new. That, yeah. That's the way it exists now. It, it, it exists now at Abbott Downing and, and Runlet where, where they, they, they currently are placed. So it's um, at, by the time we're in there for, for the middle school, the, the elementary is completely yeah. dismissed. The parking lot's empty. It's, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we, at this point, we were going to, before we get into the Millbrook Broken Ground, because it's kind of something separate, we were going to have Terry talk a little bit about uh, transportation in general and and the, how it's going to look at the new school. Sure. Can I make a pitch to anybody who wants to be a school bus driver? <laughs> <laughs> you, you sure can. I have some applications with me. It's, it's kind of a rigorous process. But um, I was just asked to do some preliminary um, evaluations as to would it be more costly from a transportation perspective if we move to the new site. Um, we have a brand new software system, which we're not expert in yet, but we're learning and we're using it now to build the current routes and we're using them on a daily, a daily basis. But there is a little bit of flexibility to allow us to see what I call targets or where the kids are or where we need to provide service. Um, and roughly we, in the current location, we have about 196 kids that are, so in, in uh, the school board policy is it's a one mile walkout, a non-eligible zone for elementary kids, a mile and a half from middle school and two miles for high school. And that's been in place for years and years. Um, and that's, those are the areas we service. So because of that, there are around 196 kids around the existing school that we don't provide service to unless um, they're near the, the edges, the margins, and they want to, with permission, to go to an existing bus stop that's in the eligible zone. So we do accommodate um, a, a couple of dozen uh, kiddos there to, to allow them a ride. Um, in the new scenario at that same one and a half mile marker, um, there's about 88 kids that are, would be geographically in the walk. The walkout is also like as you walk, take a left on Main Street or right on South Street, that kind of thing. That's how the walk zone is measured. Um, so um, because of our experience with the Millbrook and Broken Ground School, we don't like, uh, we don't, we don't, um, we, 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 we consider um, the area on East Side Drive south of, if you, I don't know if you could bring that slide back, um, south of the 393 interchange. So the overpass there is sort of an artificial boundary which says that anybody that is south of that line would be eligible for a bus. So for lack of a better word, we're considering that's a hazard. So the, the walk zone would go almost a little bit into the, what I call the bird streets, you know, um, um, you know Partridge and um, um, I have to see the, I'm, I'm stumped here, but um, anyways, um, 
so there are a bunch of, it's also a fairly uh, densely populated area because of the, 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 the gardens and, and some of the other developments in that, in that neighborhood. So taking that into consideration, um, if we, if we um, the eligible zone would give us um, um, about 43 kids that would not um, be eligible for a ride to the new school. So if you take 196, you minus you know 50-ish, you know in comparison, uh, it's about 150 kids. That might mean on a, on a middle school bus we can fit about 51 to 55 kids, depending on the size of the bus, uh, two to a seat. So that could be potentially three more like vehicles that would during that spell of de delivering kids and picking up kids from the middle school would be would be needed. Um, however, it's not. Um, and I want to jump right to my conclusion or whatever. When we look at um, transportation, we we look at it as a, as a whole. And um, my my sense is that the difference is going to be negligible. The numbers are not sizable enough. Um, there are 85 route segments that build the big buses today. So if I had three in the morning, 50, 50, and 50, and then three in the afternoon, 50, 50, and 50. That's, that's only six more segments of 85, which is about a 6% increase. However, in like 2011, we found when we consolidated the schools, we had fewer schools, we needed more um, like buses, so to speak, or more, more, more ability to service. The trade-off was, uh, surprised me a little bit, that the buses that are not, um, you know, that are being used for the elementary tier and for the high school would potentially run fewer miles because we could spread the load out across different, in a, in a different fashion. So um, we deliver the service too, where we go in the morning and we go in the high school, then we go to the elementary, and then we go to middle school. In the afternoon, we go to the elementary, we go to the high school, and then the middle school. And the, I believe the bell times historically have been developed because of the, 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 the ability or the inability of, of transportation to be everywhere at the same time. So we maximize our assets so that we're, they're fully utilized in two or three tiers, depending on the geography of, of, of the area they're traveling. So, um, you know, where, you have, where it's built, we would, we would look at um, sort of a blank slate and we would work towards, usually start with the middle school because it's not combined with anything else. And we would find a, we would find a solution to get all the kids that need to get there. And, and I don't believe that the, um, the, the overall miles might be might be less. Um, you know, here's an example. You have a family member, you bring them to school over here, and then you come back and you go to work over here, you're putting all those miles. If you get another car in the family or whatever, the overall miles might go down a little bit because they're doing their piece. And you know, it, it, it's kind of a balancing act. But the cost per mile is what I what I, I, I look at in the budget, and I don't I don't think it's gonna gonna move the needle very much. The exemptions for, it sounded like you were saying, you know, the radius, the one and a half mile radius, you were making some special considerations for the fact that the highway is, it changes that radius, or what, what was that? When, before consolidation, there was Dame School, which was on Canterbury Street, and Eastman School, and the three and fifth graders went to one school, and the other kids went to the other. Um, and, and then when consolidation happened, and they were all at the Broken Ground Millbrook campus, we saw that there were a lot of kids in the, in the Concord Gardens, in the, in the Royal Gardens, and in and, and that neighborhood that would, would potentially walk to school or be required to walk to school. And we didn't want them crossing the bridge. So at that point in time, we said we're, we're going to make an exception to the, the non-eligible zone and say that the, 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 the zone as it's drawn from the school will end here and everybody south there would be eligible for a ride. All across the city, uh, you know, Terry comes to me or I have parents that reach out to me into my office um, to ask for waivers as to the mile, mile and a half or two miles based on the conditions, right? And so it's critical, obviously safety is our priority. And um, so it's critical that we look at that and make those accommodations as, 
Um, you know, I, th I, I was just over at McKee Circle the other day, heading over to Runlet and to Abbott Downing, and watching little ones cross McKee Circle was, um, as I was sitting at the light, was, you know, it's, it, it's a place that's very, you know, it's a challenging area. So like that, we try to provide, um, and I have provided service for youngsters because it's about safety. I have a question about the busing. Um, if we are already short bus drivers, what is the district's plan for further retention of bus drivers and potentially adding new ones? Um, I'm hoping we're going into a, a negotiation. Um, we're, we're in the, the last year of their contract, and I'm hoping that the, uh, the, the and I can, you know, um, maybe put a plea to the <coughs> school board that we um, find a, comp a competitive rate and, 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 a, and a way to attract um, people to come to this industry. Most of the drivers that we have and that we're most successful with, we train our own. So they, they come in with an operator. There might be a person that's got a, a kid in the district. They want to follow the district calendar sort of thing. And they're, they're usually the ones most successful. Retirees, re, you know, uh, retired police, retired fire, um, retired teachers, um, <coughs> d different types of people that this, this fits well with. So, um, but we need to attract people from other industries, I think, that are, you know, the alternative is to go work somewhere else and figure that out. The one benefit is we do let you bring your child to, to work. Uh, you can ride the bus. And if you have a child that, like, goes to Abbott Downing, we try to, we try to you know, um, support you in getting the Abbott Downing bus so you can actually bring your own child to work and then to school. So th those types of things we've used uh, rigorously over time, but because of the you know the national shortage and everything else we're we're in a situation where we we gotta I, I believe we have to spend some money and make this happen and that's regardless of 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 where or whether we build any new school that we, we got to do that now to continue to function um do you have any idea of whether the if there are increased number of students that need to be bused whether you would be able to absorb that in the existing number of runs or do you have any idea how many additional buses might be needed Every year is different, and then the number of drivers and the just the, the scenarios are different. So we've, you know, with COVID was an example where we had to completely, you know, change our operation. And then we had cohorts with A on Monday and B on Tuesdays, and only 13 kids a bus. So whatever this whatever this scenario that's placed before us, where this kind of becomes a think tank, and I'm using drivers and I'm using experienced supervisors that have driven the routes regularly, and we sit down and we just map this out. It takes weeks and weeks. But we usually do that work over the summertime, so everybody thinks we're just hanging out. We're, we're, we're working pretty hard. Um, when um, we um, sit, re rephrase your question, I mean, I, not I was rephrase just asking, it, do you have any repeat. idea if we built a school at Broken Ground, would you need more buses because you might be busing more students, or could you absorb that in the existing runs? The fleet itself has, um, I believe it's 27 buses right now. So we're not utilizing all of them, some of them because we don't have people to drive them, some because they're, 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 they're being phased out and replaced and that sort of thing. So um, there are assets available. Um, we. We, we need to figure out where all of the kids are going to be. And like I said, so for example, historically we would bring about 18 buses into Runlet and the balance was 18 buses out almost every single day. Today I'm bringing in I think 14 buses inbound in the morning, and I'm sorry, 19 buses inbound in the morning and 14 in the afternoon going home. And part of that is because it's open-ended. I gotta get them on time, bell time for breakfast and into classes you know, by 8.20. 8.30 at the very latest. In the afternoon, I have a little bit more <coughs> leeway and the buses can run a little bit longer. So part of the solution has been that we've had fewer runs, condensed runs, longer runs, more seats filled. Um, that is the type of thing we do regularly every day as we're grooming this. So if we went back to a scenario where we had a balance of you know 17 or 18 in the morning, that would be different from you know 19 and 14. So, um, but that also means that those 19 are all carrying fewer kids. There's a point too where you have to serve all point, all places on the compass because you know as much as you may go up Mountain Road and you go to Hoyt Road and you go all around there, you might only pick up 25, 30 kids. You might have you know 30 seats left over, but you can't utilize them because you've already traveled 48 minutes and you're 
and you're, um, you know, you, you have to get to school on time. So that type of thing we do to whether we're going to have two or three going up Oak Hill Road, you know, how many buses we're going to have in that quadrant. And whenever we have the opportunity to have as, as many, you know, as resources as possible, we're going to try to make it as, 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 as a pleasant to ride, you know, in as, as reasonable length of time. And Terry, the question that um, Liz posed was, um, do you anticipate having to add any buses um, and increase in numbers? Now, I heard you say that you said the increases would be ne negligible. Is that right? I believe, that, I believe the cost would be negligible. I would think that we may need uh, uh, some number of vehicles that would would be engaged in doing something else, redeployed to, to to focus on any any extra any extra kids that might be there. It's it it's not a it's not a linear. Um, I need 50 kids. I got to go get another 50, 50 buses. I got 27 buses. I'm using them for field trips. I'm you, you know the balance. Yeah, I guess I wasn't talking about buses. I was maybe I'm using the wrong word. Runs like if you have 19 routes in the morning. That was my question. Whether you might Not, need 25 routes or 19 routes at 85 segments. So I'm saying is right on paper, right? No, eight. <laughs> so I think, right. Yeah, yeah, right. I no, I, no, 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 right, right. It's it's 85 segments, and I'm saying is yeah. least common denominator. I'm gonna I'm gonna likely need six more segments to add to the 85 to make it 91 segments for just the middle school, okay. which might mean that it, of of the 30 segments or whatever for elementary. They may not travel a thousand miles. They may only travel eight hundred miles. So that that from a cost perspective, it's it's the cost per mile that drives the whole you. the whole the whole process. So it's not just necessary vehicles. And this is where your new software comes in. It will come into play to help with that. It will help with the with the planning absolutely, yeah. and that will yeah. So that will be as we able to try to figure out whatever is most efficient. So. Um, I have a question about. Um, the distance, um, how is that measured? The driveway that is going to be so helpful for vehicle queuing is really long for walking students. So that's probably a quarter mile. Um, so is that counted in the mile and a half? Yeah, when we did the initial plan for this, I asked for the diagram where the school was going to be, and there's actually a flag in, in, in that general area near the front plaza somewhere, which is what we're what we're using, and it's very similar to Broken Ground in Millbrook. That it's, it's you know, it's 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 not that significant. Okay. I have another question. Um, bus traffic from other parts of the city, non East Side, will those be routed through 393 or up 93 to the roundabout? On any given day, we are looking at traffic and different issues. Even today, we go we go different ways. Okay. You know, to get to Millbrook and Broken Ground and to any school, it varies every every day. Not the route itself, but you know, the, where we're picking up students. But when we're going deadhead to the to 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 do that assignment or returning, um, it's it's they're, they're talking to each other on the radio, and we're trying to figure out just the best way to get through traffic. And so, have the traffic studies addressed how this traffic would be impacting the roundabout at Mountain Road, where Eastside Drive and the gas station is? And the highway interchange there. So, do you, so no. it seems like that should maybe be something that is yeah. also included here, if that's a potential route for all these buses and parental traffic. So, I think geographically, when we talked to the city, um, we, we this is a this was we studied the intersections that are shown here. So, beyond that, I'm not sure there is a. Um, I think when I was talking to the traffic consultant. They talk about if you're adding more than 100 trips, like 100 cars to any intersection, then it should be studied. So that's where you really focus on, that's why the traffic study focused on the intersections here because by the time all the cars get to this area, these are the intersections that potentially could have 100 additional cars going through them so they get studied. But if you're talking about sending five buses or 18 buses through a different intersection, um, that typically doesn't trigger the need to study the traffic. But if, if there's no requirement that the buses are coming 93 um, from downtown to Eastside Drive, they could just as well be going up 93, taking exit 16 and coming down Eastside Drive from the north. 
if that is a potential, why is that not being studied? So I think it's, it's again. I think it's just all about trips. The amount of trips. If there's not, if there were a hundred buses and a hundred buses were going to go, go potentially different routes, then any time those hundred buses went through that intersection, it would warrant part of a traffic study. But because they're under that limit, that's just. It's I guess I don't know why the 393 interchange would be studied, but not the 93 then, because they have they could, they're both at play. Uh, Good question. I think this this was more when we the intersections that were chosen were chosen specifically with the city. So the city kind of helped direct where they thought the traffic would be the most, and that's where it was studied. So, and, and actually, and, it's so. more it's more intersections than we typically look at when we do schools. Typically, we look at where you know the roads are coming out directly from the school onto the, the main road. So this mm -hmm. is actually a lot compared to a normal study. And if it were. 19 ish buses, you know, leaving that school in the afternoon, it would be, you know, eight and eight kind of thing that would, you know, it, it, it's not a lot of vehicles and they pretty, they exit the area pretty quickly. The way, the way the routes are designed typically too, that you start the farthest from the school and then bring them to the school. So the kids are not on the bus, you know, the kids that are close by aren't going for a long ride and vice versa. So you're dropping them off. So it's where the kids are. We wouldn't go up to exit 17, you know, with multiple buses because the kids just don't live up there. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna send one up Mountain Road. We're gonna send, you know, um, two or three down to the Gardens Bridge Turnpike, the, you know, that, that part of the neighborhood. We're gonna get several to come across the river. Um, Probably along the 393 corridor, you know, that would would come into then exit 15, and some would go down to the south end, and they would go to exit 12, perhaps, and then some might, you know, or many would come by, you know, where my office is at the comp, and they would go up into, you know, the Fisherville Road area and the Even Meadow neighborhoods and that sort of thing. So uh, it's going to disperse on its own pretty quickly. Mm. And, and I will say, traffic studies are not perfect. I think um, the traffic engineers they use algorithms, I'm sure, in different ways to determine where they predict cars are going to go. But um, obviously, when you put your app on and Waze tells you go that way or this way, you know, um, and I'm sure it's always a challenge. But as Tina said, this was, a, we, we went beyond what we would typically see on a school project in terms of the intersections we study mm -hmm. for this project. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, so. Just a quick recap, um, we just showed all the, these are all the sections that the traffic study, um, what was studied by the traffic study, I was saying the same word twice. Um, we also focused on when we were on the site, making ex extremely long driveways so we can get all the cars off of the roads so that the idea is that traffic is just constantly flowing onto the site and getting off the main roads to help alleviate traffic. Um, so that those were the two main takeaways. And then finally, for safety, making sure the bus and, and traffic were, um, parent drop off were, were separated. So one last piece that was looked at, if I can just pull it up here, um, looking at the Millbrook and Broken Ground traffic, um, there was these three intersections where you have cars going in and out in the same area. These cars come in here and go around. Um, the Traffic counts were taken and just uh, visible observations were made by the um, traffic engineers. Um, they noticed uh, vehicle, extreme vehicle queuing, um, incorrect lane usage. Um, I think, again, this was kind of a wide lane here. So they saw if someone stopped, you know, parents being impatient and potentially driving around a car when they shouldn't be passing on a road like this. Um, so pedestrian safety was, was observed in terms of um, it wasn't, it wasn't completely safe. Um, and then restricted sight lines, you know, when you have cars there um, and as people are coming in and out. So their main recommendations was to improve on-campus operations, um, to alleviate frequency of vehicles from queuing by taking them off of South Curtisville Road. So again, that's kind of what, we, what they told us for the, the new school, but the idea was we need to create a longer drive here. Um, so we were gonna work with the district to come up with a solution that would increase the length of drive that people would be able to drop off. So you'd be turning off South Curtisville Road, alleviating some of that traffic. Um, then we had uh, provide northbound left turn lane along South Curtisville Road. 
So as you're coming up here, actually have a left turn lane so some so people can pass you in a safe manner while you're turning. And then again, stripe uh, the center line along South Curtisville Road, which is this whole line here. So trying to make that so people understand where cars travel and where they don't. So they're kind of simple solutions. Um, but this is not part of this project. Sorry. So it, I think, you know, it's something that the district's going to look at. And I don't know if Matt wants to jump in here, but it seems like that might be part of the, uh, the facilities group. It is. We'll be looking at, at our capital improvement plan. Um, we know we want to address it, but we want to take the approach of how can we safely do it and how do we blend it um, in as a separate project, but how it relates to the new school. Okay. Can I comment on this one real quick? I'm just yes. confused what the left turn lane accomplishes here. Is this for queuing in the morning to provide that left turn movement? Yes, yeah, so when parents are dropping off, they're trying to come in. They can either come in at the far end, right, to go into Millbrook, or yep. they can come in to go to Broken Ground. And so I think that whole area backs up. So if there's an additional... From the south. Yeah, yeah. so if there's an additional lane, parents can, like, pull into that and then turn into so, Broken Ground. But we'd have to widen the entire road down to Portsmouth Street to be three lanes and then have vehicles queued in the middle? Because otherwise, you'd have vehicles queued on the side, and then they move over to left turn lane, and it defeats the purpose. I think it, um, it was the left turn lane was just between um, this part of the drive. It wasn't the entire lane. Well, right. No, so I, I, that's what I I'm saying, though. The, yeah, there's currently the, the width of it right now is currently wider than it needs to be. I think they were, I believe that when they observed it, it could accommodate mm -hmm. a left turn lane while people could still pass by. Because it is, that's why there's so much confusion right now. It's such a wide road sure. without any striping. So I think. That, that was my understanding was that that's what the left turn lane would have done. I'm just confused how you get the queuing vehicles to the left turn lane without crossing the through lane and essentially negating the benefit of the left turn lane. Yeah, say that one more time. So if you, if you have the left turn lane to help alleviate the queuing by letting vehicles bypass the queue, mm -hmm. you either need to have the queue entirely in the middle of the road so there's no conflict sure. or you have the vehicles queued on the side of the road like they are now, and then they have to cross to the left turn lane anyway, like they're doing today. So the question so is, how long could that queue lane be? And it, it, get back to you on that. It, it almost seems like you should just flip the circulation of this and mm -hmm. have them come in from Portsmouth Street. So there's no yeah, left turn conflicts. We've done a couple of like but, conceptual sketches on it, but yeah. I think you know when it becomes a real project, that we'll have mm -hmm. to have a survey done, no, and yeah. the civil mm -hmm. engineers got to lay things out yeah. so we can understand it. But I, I don't want to yeah. this issue well, really, too much. I just, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, I think no. no, those are great questions. But this issue really came up from our parents, you know, that we're concerned about people passing on that road, trying to get into the school. So, given that we had. Uh, folks from traffic out there evaluating in that area, we took advantage of that and said, hey, would you take a look at Broken Ground and Millbrook um, entrance and exit? So um, they did and gave us feedback, but we really aren't ready to do that project because the board board doesn't know that yet. Um, and um, so we'll be bringing it to capital facilities and Matt. Um, Matt also has a capital improvement plan for the district, a 10-year plan. So, you know, we'll work with the capital facilities to address that because we do need to do something. Yeah. No, not, a, not the only school, though, you know. We, um, we, um, I was going to say, uh, I'm, I'm going to hear from my... You're going to hear from this because, yeah, because yeah, yeah. this is one of my topics. Actually, yeah. this school is probably the best school as far as that traffic situation goes. Uh, no, the yeah, other, my, my kids go to Beaver Meadow. And it's Beaver Meadow very is very similar. Similar. Beaver Meadow. Meadow is far worse yeah. because yeah. <laughs> they're backed all the way down around yeah. to Fisherville, yeah. and they are parking. The, they park right. in the yeah, uh, exactly. cemetery yeah. instead of yeah. cross. So I'm it happy to hear that Mr. Cashman has this on yeah. his yeah. Uh, agenda to bring up on all of the elementary so schools. Right. Um, I I know that the traffic at at Abbott Downing is pretty bad too. That's one it of the is. biggest concerns. Um, and one of the concerns they have now with both the middle school and the elementary school, literally, right, sharing the same route. I mean, I think a lot more parents drive now since the pandemic, mm -hmm. because obviously everybody drove during the pandemic and then people got kind of used to that. So I think there's more cars now than, maybe there was more buses. 
post, like pre-pandemic. Right. Unfortunately, yeah, there's more private vehicles. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to kind of thank you for switching the view, too, because I was trying to figure out how the new middle school traffic worked with the Millbrook um, situation. So I see that you've got the buses uh, would be coming down that that same, so the parents' buses uh, for Millbrook and Broken Ground are, you know, using that road right now. I'm familiar with that, but kids go to the Millbrook goes to Millbrook, um, and then the buses would be added in in this new configuration. An hour, an hour later. An hour later. Yes. Right, right. So, but, yes. and maybe I can speak to that. They're the same buses, so the buses will go to Broken Ground, Millbrook, and then turn back and go to get the middle schoolers. So it's the same bus, just coming twice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, so maybe you might have missed the first slide. We were talking about how the parents are all coming in this way, right, for drop-off and pick-up, and the buses are all coming in this way. Yeah. And, parent, and teachers are parking in this lot, primarily, and visitors. So the sign for the new school will be here. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, oh, I was going to ask, what's the date? Do you, I mean, I know this is all very theoretical right now, but any uh, date of when you think the middle school is planned to be open? Like, if you were to say, you know, you're 2038, you know, what's the... Yeah, so I believe the current schedule has construction starting um, January of 26. And there's a, uh, I think it's a 30 month construction schedule to be start all the way complete. So August of 29. 28. 28. August 28. So August of 28 would be yeah. the first time in the school would be. 6, 27, 20. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> We're counting down. So um, I have a question that's slightly jumping topic. So yeah. So this is, as I said, this concludes the presentation. Okay. So <laughs> let's have conversations questions. and ask any questions. Okay, great. This is going backwards a little bit. Um, so you mentioned the um, traffic signals um, that were uh, warranted at um, South Curtisville and Eastside and um, and at 393 westbound ramps. Um, and it, you noted that, or it, I think it said in there that it was 2038. Was any sooner date evaluated? Is that the only date that they calculated? I want to say it's 2028 and 2038. I think are the two windows that when they when they did it, I okay. believe. And they did both. 2028 was not, but 2038 met the one. It's all n uh, nicely yeah. outlined, Nicole, in your report. It might not be that clear. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We'll try to make for it For people to know what they're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, traffic reports are very difficult to read. I, I, well, I, you, think, yeah. I was like, I think traffic reports are actually super complicated to make sure you got all the stuff in there and didn't yeah. forget anything. So I did not see that the warrants were listed for 2028, only 2038. Correct. Um, that is my understanding. Well, I mean, they weren't included. Like, okay. This, like I'll the, double check the that, but I, I thought they looked at two, and maybe they only included 2038 because it was the only one that, that met the warrant. That was met. Okay. Um, but we can double check that question. Okay. What is and I just want to, I just want to um, also let you know that this is, this is the, this is the main report, but there are 700 pages, 700 pages total, and the rest are just appendices and supplemental data. So that will be available, I believe, online. Come on, Bobby, it already is. It's already is. Yeah, so, um, so there you go. It's, it's um, on the website under 2024 documents and presentations. Your slideshow is up there. This as a the smaller report in case if people didn't want to load a large file and then the entire thing is labeled and then while i have um on page 12 and 13 there are photos of um the approach to millbrook and broken ground if people kind of wanted to see how that does get um snagged so because i remember this one seeing that how it's two lanes, going but what through. happens is, is this car passes but it's only to turn here it's not to go around yes <laughs> yeah. It's these so. people that get sort of stranded. <laughs> so we kind of already use it as three lanes in some level. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, then jumping topics wildly again. Um, there's no discussion. So 
by the way, I just want to note that the 10-foot bike shared use path on the long driveway. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank we you. Um, I appreciate that. And um, But there's no mention of any bicycle facilities or lack of facilities or discussion at all about bike accessibility for the site in the traffic, traffic study. Okay. Yeah. Meaning like how, where they get stored or? No, like if we're looking at the traffic in the neighborhood, how is a kid on a bike mm -hmm. supposed, able to navigate that neighborhood? Are mm -hmm. they able to navigate those neighborhoods at all? Um, and what potential improvements, whether they're the districts or not the districts, should be looked at sure. to improve that? Yeah, so. like if you want to stripe a lane or something along. Yeah. Right. right. And I think it's worth noting to tag on to Nicole is it would be expected for kids to use the sidewalk on their bikes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Technically, that's illegal to have a bike on a sidewalk. I, I wouldn't encourage a kid to ride it on the shoulder, mm -hmm. you know, if the sidewalk's there. But yeah. just something to keep in mind that the bike facilities are certainly appreciated when they're right. they're there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, and maybe in that circumstance, if there are no current bike facilities, which there's not um, <laughs> that you know investigating, recommending, creating more shared use paths in the neighborhood if possible. Um, because while a sidewalk, you're not supposed to ride your bike on it, and if my options were having my kid ride their <laughs> bike on the sidewalk on East Side Drive yeah. or in the road, um, I would pick the sidewalk all day long. Yeah. Um, and East Side Drive Kids may be a tricky do. one, certainly because of the bridge, to have a wider sidewalk, but if there's opportunities to have those kind of paths and recommend those recommendations I think would be helpful. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question. Would you have put a 10 foot wide path into the school if you can't put a bike on that? Wasn't that the purpose of it? That, that, the, the purpose is, yes. I, mean, I, I, I get it, it's illegal. No, <laughs> no, that's, the, a no path. Path. That's, that's a shared use. That's, 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 that's different. Right. Yeah, I think we're talking about out in the neighborhood. Yeah, Actually, sidewalks you know, are different. Can't, you're not yeah. supposed to but in our, on our site, which yeah, we're responsible for. On our site, we're okay. We it, we're okay mm -hmm. to have that. Correct. Okay, I just want to clear Yeah, that's yeah. shared <laughs> use. That's 10 feet, then I, not Because you know, I, I know we're going to have some bike, you know, I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can take a look and see what the city has, too. I don't know if they have any plans for, like, bike routes through these neighborhoods or future bike routes or any of that. Yeah, we should ask. We should ask them. I mean, this part of the city is growing three times faster than mm -hmm. most of the other parts of the city. So, uh, with the exception of the north end by the Beaver Meadow area and up in that area, which is also growing a lot. So, I would think the city might be already having some of this in their plans, and we should probably consult with them. I know the neighbors have been asking for extended and widened okay. sidewalks for quite a while. Yeah. I know that when we calculate like um, bike routes, when we're looking at like lead points or chips points, mm -hmm. they allow us to use roads that have speed limits under 20 as a, a safe route for a bike to take into mm -hmm. a school. So I don't know what the speed limits are on those, the little roads around the neighborhoods. 25 and 30. Really? As a yeah, kind, so of, can... kind of precursor or tagging onto that, so we have, at the DOT, we have software to get speed data essentially and just out of curiosity i looked this morning mm -hmm. um i mean east side drive is posted 30 and so is portsmouth street i mean they operate closer to 40 east side drive for sure um, but portsmouth as soon as you get away from that hallway stop on either side it's it's close to 40 as well so mm -hmm. um it might be a little different during the school hour or two on either end but it's you know predominantly pretty fast mm -hmm. Could you guys talk about costs related to any of these improvements and how they fit into the project? Sure. Um, I think, you know, from the beginning when we've been looking at um, potential upgrades, you know, before the traffic study was completed, we didn't know if there would be warranted traffic signals. So there was money um, in the budget set aside for a, pot a potential traffic signal. So um, that, that is currently in the, the, the project's budget right now. Um, and again, that would be something negotiated uh, with the city. Um, and then also some of these site improvements were also tagged uh, in, in the project and kind of line items and, and allocations for these potential um, sidewalk upgrades or things like that to make sure they're safe, safe routes to schools. Um, I was just gonna say, 
was just going to add on, you know, similar to what others were saying. So, like, the, I, I think that there's kind of the aspiration of having a really great, better, safe uh, walking route from the areas that are technically walkable, you know, so the, mm -hmm. you know, closer to the heights that, well, it might not be that safe, so we have to plan for potentially busing. You know, what could we do, whether it's, again, the schools, the, you know, this plan, or part of the city to make that route safer. Um, you know, I just don't, I would love to know about that, the specific crossing of, say, the, the off ramps or the on ramps to the, the highway, that that's probably the least safe, but, you know, there's, that new, uh, you know, expansion of the retirement communities that they've been doing a lot of stuff with those sidewalks. Like there's more and more people who are using the sidewalks in that area. So I think if that is the one area that's a big problem, what could we sure. what could the city address there? I'm not sure we found big problems with the sidewalks. Uh, I don't know. Right, right. like we just, there was some minor, you know, where they had crosswalks, like we were talking about that kind of dead end into a non-accessible you know, route up onto the, you know, sidewalk across the street. Um, there was some like vegetation growing into sidewalks and blocking intersections. So it was all kind of minor things. I'm not sure what to do about crossing over the, the overpass and, you know, the amount of traffic going through there. That's a trickier situation. Although if they do end up putting a signal in there that will give people an appropriate amount of time to cross the road in that location so that would probably help i believe also if you look if you were i wish i i should have brought something to zoom out even further keep going back to it um i believe that there is a sidewalk on this mm -hmm. side of yeah. the road mm -hmm. so you don't have to cross mm -hmm. in front of the the cars yeah there's no sidewalk on the ramp side on the ramp side correct the, so there, there's sidewalk on the bridge on that yeah. side but it's mm -hmm. only on the bridge on and the bridge. then there's no sidewalk okay. on that side of the road so the idea i think like you said if there could be improvements potentially connecting to mm -hmm. and making this a little bit safer and then as you get down to south girders on the east side where that retirement village um upgrading the sidewalks there and the crosswalk i think putting the pedestrian crosswalk signs if there's a light there eventually that would be safer um, and that would allow students to cross to South Carisville Road and then again to everyone's point maybe there's a stripe for a bike lane if it's a wide enough road to help in a pedestrian area just to make people more aware that a bike might go there and that pretty much takes you right into the school um, up here if I can get back that would pretty much bring you to this intersection and then once obviously we got to the school which would be over here um, there would be a crosswalk from Portsmouth right, oh, no. it's right here yeah, yeah. so you, you know as you so I think you're the point is is taken and I think you know finding ways to yeah. keep doing that has there been I know like there's there's sidewalks on East Side Drive to a certain extent but they stop um, kind of before uh, the neighborhoods run out so I think it goes to the there's an apartment complex there where it runs to but then okay. there's a number of neighborhoods out to like Ladybug Lane that don't that have this way on there. If it, is, it's, it, is that up here? It, um, no, it would be the other way. Okay, it'd be down here more. Yes, I'm not really spatially yeah uh, <laughs> Sorry. skilled, so yeah. it's like if you were going toward like Target that direction. Okay. Um, but there's there's sidewalk and it goes to this apartment, but then there are at least two, but maybe three side streets that are pretty. Um, big that don't have any sidewalks that service them and I think it goes all the way to Ladybug Lane so that would be a way to connect in three or four pretty big neighborhoods okay. into walkability so this might be the best place to start um, going back to the city master plan because I believe they have graphics that do show all the potential areas that they're looking to add sidewalks going forward so I'm, I'd be curious if they actually had it had that area um, to try to connect. I think it's like number 38 or number 43. <laughs> 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 and it's a substantial cost investment. But they are on the safe route to schools route and not by the sidewalks. Okay. So we're asking for five to walk down them. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, do you mind going back to the slide that had the? Um, Go ahead. No, they, uh, yeah. Do you mind going back to the slide that had all the sidewalk layouts with the the new driveway sure. on it as well? This one. Yeah, that uh, yeah that works. A big one, or I can I can zoom in if you'd rather talk. Uh, about it. Either way, that that's fine. So right now the sidewalk is proposed on the right side and kind of loop around the outside of the car pickup. Yes. Correct. Um, was there any discussion to put another one on the opposite side? So, because I can guarantee that's a shorter route. Kids are going to not follow that sidewalk all the way around that parking lot. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could potentially flip it if you want. I mean, I think there's benefit to right. having it on that side with the, the with the broken right. ground and stuff side. Um, you know, similarly, I didn't know if there was any investigation to connect a sidewalk to North, North Curtisville, because um, that would cut off a substantial chunk of then going down to Portsmouth slash East Side. Um, you have the hiking so, trail, but it's very informal. Yeah, I think there's. Huh? They don't want that. Yeah, <laughs> I, figured that, I figured that's why that's I think not the driveway. Are, are not for that, so you know that that's a further discussion in terms of fencing and access, and you know, uh, you know, not being able to just drive your car down there and have make that the secondary entrance to the school and we're trying to avoid all that I could um, see that because it's not you know it's, it's not what's right and it's not the best place to go but I mean the issue there is there's a trailhead that comes off that circle right, right. now I think it's mm -hmm. going to happen regardless kids are going to use it and parents that are in a rush are going to drop their kids off there it's a how do you enforce it to have them not do that I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Tickets. Tickets, yeah. If, well, mm. everyone's short staff, so <laughs> I, mean, I don't know how do you do that. Um, yeah. I think that, that's part of the larger conversation in terms of just access and signage and yeah. mm -hmm. you know how to address that. Um, but that's definitely not the intention to allow any kind of drop off or right. pick up. I mean, I think kids walking are going to find the trails, and that's if it's an accessible trail. Right. It's a kid walking, but definitely parents driving and dropping off is not intended for them right which would actually be nice if you do live in that neighborhood or any of the others to be able to walk down that street yeah. and get on oh, the right. trail to the right. school mm -hmm. it's like a 50 foot connection that's going to happen regardless mm -hmm. might as well make it so kids don't trip on a route but <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm thinking of like you know the the fever gun the audubon mclean centers trails are just so you know smooth and you mm -hmm. know so those like a trail, but it's just much more safe. But yeah, again, is that what they want? Do they want to encourage them? And then I guess going back to your question about sidewalks on the other side, yeah. there's always a balance of cost. Sure. You know, sure. and how much redundancy would you put in? And I think we've been, been trying to um, be as fiscally conservative when it comes to things, you mm. know, as possible. Um, so, but but I think. That's part of what this conversation we're having with this, right, right. The feedback we're looking for from you, and we can always cost things out, and, and we've done that on other things from other committees. You know, it's gotten costs for right. ideas like this. I'm just concerned if the sidewalk is only on the side it's proposed now that kids are going to cross across the parking lot and interrupt the car line essentially, mm -hmm. um, and and you know I don't want them to get run over because they're taking a shortcut and cutting that corner off. Sure. We can look at that with but, our landscape and civil engineer and then just see, you know, we'll zoom in on it and see what's the yeah. best, shortest route. Yeah, even if it stopped at the bottom of the parking lot or just had a little crosswalk, like you don't have to go down the entire oh. quarter mile or whatever it is, <clears throat> um, both sides, mm -hmm. but, you know, just have it mm -hmm. crossing there and have... Would you, are you suggesting both or I, like just I, I would move keep, it to the other I side? I would keep the one that's there now, but also add from the school to the bottom of the parking lot on yeah. the left side. So you're talking about adding... Right. Yeah, yeah, minimum, yeah. Mm -hmm. And have a crossing. Are you encouraging kids to cross them? Well, right see, there? That, that's another one. Yeah. Yeah. But they're going to have to cross somewhere. I mean, if, it, depending on which direction you're coming from, somebody oh, has to cross. Right, I guess you could make the argument they're if they're cutting way, one way, they're going to cut the other way. If they yeah. stay on the outside here, then we're no well. crossing of traffic for, for the students. It, yeah, the yeah. idea is if you're but coming here, you're yeah, going all the way around the outside. Have you been at Runlet in the morning or in the afternoon when... The cars and the buses are there, and the kids are crossing over. You you can't honestly. It, it's it's mm -hmm. very. It's why we got so many deficiencies around safety, because 
kids were crossing, and it's it it and you, you can't separate out two rows of cars and kids coming on from even over from Ava Downing, right? They come up that side. It's it it really does create um, challenging situations relative to safety for the kids. That 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 would be my biggest concern. I hear what you're saying. It would be easier. Um, and we do have two adults. I mean, we put two adults out there, so um, crossing over and making sure. But because we know it's uh, dangerous. I mean, I think your point is well taken, That, but I don't even know that putting the sidewalk on the other side is going to stop them from just crossing through the parking it lot. It might not. I feel like... Short they, of a fence, like the, I, I keeping was, them corralling well, on, I, them on the sidewalk. But they might climb the fence. <laughs> yeah. so, I was going to say, I feel well, like the fight. theme of, of my comments at all these committee meetings is, but the kids are just going to do stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Kids are kids, I know. So, so it's, it's hard to figure out what is the safest thing that will yeah. help them make good choices. And I... Who's that park not meant to be for? Is that all the faculty? Faculty and, and visitors mm -hmm. that would come probably after school starts. Yeah. Maybe parks, park. Uh, it, in a, but that's where, again, like to think of what parents might do, like if you go and, you know, to park or something, you know, is that something you, you could see happening with dropping off your kid? Is it not meant? I mean, I guess I don't yeah, know. no, I, I agree I with you because like I think what's the parent stop driving parents here, from driving park, here, drop and off, cutting across here, dropping their kid off, and then cutting them off short lane. Mm -hmm. You might think about putting that entrance back here. Mm -hmm. So now it doesn't become as attractive. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is keep this line no moving at least through there, there, there as quickly as possible. Right? So yes. that it's because if this line moves quickly, then people aren't going to want to come down. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. So the key is keeping this line, and that the long length is great because that's one of the real negatives that we have right now at our existing school, and that parents and teachers and students and everybody has complained about, as you all remember from 2017. Yeah, absolutely. But I wouldn't want to create another little thing right there, so I might look at that as possible. Is, is there some... Because, yes, there are parents that park and carry their projects and and that stuff in and do that at different times in the morning but uh, and we want to make them have a good parking space but I won't want them cutting through that dropping their kid off and cutting through because yeah. that also happens quite a bit right now in that people who don't want to wait at Runlet they drop their kids on a variety of different just on the side of the road a bunch of places now just to to get them off how wide is that loop? <laughs> the yeah. loop, I believe, is 24 feet. I think. So it's two car wide two cars. versus? Correct. Yeah. Again, we're always trying to ensure that if someone's broke down, you always have a way to go around them. And then also, you know, if someone's taking their time to drop off, you are able to safely pull around them um, and trying to limit crossing. So you will have staff coming right here, crossing mm -hmm. the traffic, you know. Presumably those are adults. But potentially they're in but earlier than the kids, right? So that parking lot is probably going to be mm -hmm. mostly full except for the visitor spots. So there's not going to be a lot of like open spots for people to just pop oh. into. And they don't, they don't need to park. They just need to get out of line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's, you know, it, there's, there's never a perfect solution to this. Mm -hmm. It's always the hardest part it's, is trying to yeah. like said, guide people to make the best right. decisions right. possible and, no matter what and then try to enforce... Yeah. You know, by, I think I, I was thinking of my school when I drop off, there's a way to kind of cut back and take a shortcut to go back out. Yeah. And they always park a car there, you know, <laughs> every morning. And then the car leaves and the car goes back and parks there. So people can't do it. So there's there's ways to deter and you know, assigning posts of don't let the kids cross here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep going straight. So can you condense out or sure. zoom out, unzoom? What will keep parents from coming here? Again, you know, signage, signage is signage. Signage. buses only. Okay, mm -hmm. and <laughs> just enforcement of buses only. <laughs> <laughs> Who will be parked in that parking lot during the 
at the morning. That right now is planned for overflow and for field use. Um, so if you have large events in your um, auditorium or mm -hmm. in your graduation gym, or graduation, like that. then that would be used for those after hour type events. Um, but during school hours, that right now, um, outside of the bus loop, is not currently planned for. And you it. wouldn't put teacher parking there. Uh, the idea is they were trying to keep as much traffic off of South Curtisville Road in the okay. morning. Mm -hmm. um, Fair enough. Even though you know it could be more controlled, you you know you don't want to encourage parents or anyone to think that that's a, a an accessible lot. No, that's a good. We did. I think we were talking that there it could be the idea of of a, of a gate after the buses come in and leave. Maybe there's a gate that goes down, so you can't actually get in there unless you're an emergency vehicle that has um, the the keys to the gate. Um, so. There's different there's different mechanisms that depending on how, how how far you want to take it, you can prevent you know traffic from going in there when you don't want it. But it could be a nice amenity for the community on the weekends or after school hours. They can park there and get on the trails. They can park there and walk the track. You know. Yeah. It's nice to have some parking because no, right now you can't really park when you're getting on the trails out there, right? Not from this end anyway. Yeah, no, there's, that would be beneficial to people from the city who are using the trails and people right. from the neighborhood and yeah. in that area that are using the basketball courts yeah. and things. And like the track, right? Yeah. On the track. The track and the track as well. That'll get that yeah. we've heard um, people utilize. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're thinking about it. That's all I want is that you're thinking yeah. about. Yeah. Was there any consideration? Um, so I know that you wouldn't necessarily think about the school staff coming in and conflicting with the parents in the morning because the staff is at the school. Um, but given the offset of time between when Millbrook and Broken Ground open, was there consideration to the additional traffic on Portsmouth Street <coughs> for the staff coming in at the same time that the elementary school is already, ex schools are already experiencing congestion in that area? Yes, in the traffic study. I think you'll see that in the diagrams that they have in there that they were accounting for. Um, Did, do they have diagrams for the elementary school peak times or just the middle school peak yes. times? Uh, I believe just the middle school. Just the middle school. Right, but my question is about the morning elementary peak time. Morning elementary peak time is 7.30. Right, but I'm saying the teachers at the staff. middle school would, would be... Um, come in 20 minutes before school, so they are expected in the building at 8:10. You still have a buffer between the two, so I I see what you're saying. You're saying teachers traffic, right? 100, you got 100 teachers and 800, 8, mm -hmm. 750 kids in the school, so you got about 8, 100 staff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the mm -hmm. the hours um, that are that by contract um, that mm -hmm. teachers are expected in the building, it's it's um, 20 minutes before. So you think about it, it's 8.10. And what time do they, are they contracted to be there after school? 20 Three. minutes after, so it would be, you know, 10 minutes of four. Uh, you know, the, you know oh, no, that? Of the elementary school. Oh, so the it same, be, it's the same, Tw 20 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So that would be like? <clears throat> There'd be a 40 minute buffer. 2.50 or something. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I mean. I live right near Krista McAuliffe. I would say that those teachers are never leaving at two fifty. Mm. Like that's not when those teachers are leaving. The well, you have a lot of teachers at the middle school that don't don't leave. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. When I mean, you think about it, there are so many of them um, coaching and doing after school programs. I mean, the kids are, you know, ex incredibly busy. So. Um, you're right, um, th and and then this 21st century, we have teachers who work in our after school um, program for our sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. You know, after school program. So, y you're right, Nicole. It's a hard, it's a hard number to really tie down, but we do use that 20 minutes, and that's mm -hmm. when they're expected to be there. I think. I mean, I think that elementary school teachers leaving would have been accounted for in the actual traffic counts because that that's a school that's operational mm -hmm. um, but it's when the middle school teachers arrive that I was wondering because those are new trips and there's already well, we a pretty yeah. significantly do documented that. problem in the neighborhood um, with traffic in the morning in well not I've been there many mornings and it doesn't get past the Portsmouth Street. It comes down to South Coast. Well, I think you point out a good reason as to my prior question, which is 
but why the teacher's park coming off of Portsmouth Street. That's probably the, one of the best things you yeah. could do, actually. And I, Yeah, I was going to say, the access for the road is here, if you look at my hand. Mm -hmm. So if you think um, teachers coming in, they're going to go the path, the path of least resistance. So I would imagine they would go down um, East Side Drive and come up uh, Portsmouth Road over here and then go in the back so they don't actually mingle with the traffic there. If yeah, you know, if they overlap, which we, we heard from Kathleen that the buffer is, mm -hmm. we believe is still significant. But okay, I, I understand. I'm not disagreeing now. with yeah. the route. You were asking if they or mm -hmm. like no complaints about what's there. I just want to know if it was studied and actually evaluated to see what right. the impacts would be there. Because um, I think when they distributed the traffic, they didn't distribute any traffic coming up East Side Drive. Um, they assumed everyone coming from like the 393 direction was going to turn onto South Curtisville and s and then get to Portsmouth instead of having people go straight up east side to Portsmouth, which assuming that no traffic is going to do that is probably not realistic. Nicole, I think a lot of parents would skip the four way stop and go around. If you read through the traffic study mm -hmm. and you have questions, you should shoot them over to us and then we can connect with I was like, I realize that you're yeah, no, yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, we're happy to answer those questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so one of the things that we thought for this committee would be to, because um, you just got the report tonight, right? So um, take a look at it. We'll reset for another meeting so that we have questions and, um, and uh, people can ask questions and discuss it more and we will have question, answers to some of the questions that were brought up tonight. So. Yeah, and if there's anything we, you would like to, us to present that we didn't present, um, if we have the information, we're happy to present it next time. Yeah. So please feel free to reach out to us and let us know. Yeah, okay. Is there a question over here? Public questions or we don't public usually do public comment. We don't usually comment. have public questions. But does anybody in the committee have any objections to the question from no, no go yeah. ahead but please <laughs> but please do so to a microphone oh, yeah. thank you there you go thank you uh, Thank you all for serving on this committee and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm Xander Rice Hawkins. I live in Ward 10. I have students at Millbrook and Broken Ground. Um, I'm also the former city councilor for this district and um, served on the Transportation Policy Advisory Committee, so I know our safe okay. <laughs> discussion. <laughs> so for a little bit of context. So um, I'll just kind of run through a list of questions or thoughts. Um, so we don't have a back and forth because I want to monopolize the time, but um, a couple things that came up. Um, so it was mentioned about going to the planning committee. I would encourage to make sure that the Transportation Policy Advisory Committee, that we build in time for the Transportation Policy Advisory Committee with the city and the um, Bicycle Pedestrian Subcommittee, because I'm sure that both of those would like to take a look at this and weigh in mm -hmm. on options. It also is important because it um, there are city investments that, um, as we're making changes, might be able to be paired and partnered with these. Um, I was curious whether or not the conversations around the I-93 widening um, are reflected in some of these recommendations or um, areas for improvement. The last iteration I saw um, did have uh, a plan to push traffic to Eastside Drive, both in the short term and in the long term. So I want to make sure that we're planning appropriately for that. Um, ideally, those would be offset by traffic times, right? But I would just want to make sure that those are reflected. Um, yeah. yeah, I absolutely can. Yeah, I'll send it to the committee too. Um, the for she the can lanes. Send them to me. Why don't you send them to me, and I'll make sure they get to them so I can see them too. So. Perfect. Oh, absolutely, Rather that'll work than, fine. Yeah. Um, for the lanes entering, um, so you put two lanes, uh, uh, sorry, and, and two lanes for the long road into uh, the middle school, which I love, by the way, the long road. So one of the things at Mill Burke and Broken Ground is that when you enter. Um, you exit through a different road, and um, there definitely are people using the lanes inappropriately. But one of the reasons why is sometimes people are coming in and they need to park, not at, and so they can't actually take the time to wait in line. They're either 
parking because they're walking up to pick up their student or they're dropping something off. And I would imagine, I don't have middle schoolers yet, but there would probably be more of that because you've got sports practice and things that pe people may do. Mm -hmm. So I just want to flag that you don't, you don't have the space for people to do that. I like the conversation about it's a wider lane, but just like building in a plan that if a parent act, is actually just coming to park after school or coaches who are coming in to coach middle school sports, that you know they could go to the staff parking lot, but maybe the parent, we want to have that conversation so folks, we're not directing some folks up there when we don't want people going up there, but also having that opportunity. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> um, the, let's see, the safe routes to school, I'm glad there was a conversation about that. One of the things that um, was so hard for me uh, was knowing that we have existing safe routes to schools that do not have appropriate sidewalks for our K through five kids. Um, and I think we should, and they are cost prohibitive. Um, and would take a lot of work to bump those up in the city priorities. If we're gonna be making an investment in a middle school here, that is definitely a conversation we should bring to the front um, and have that at the same time. Um, and then for specific transportation policy around kids walking back and forth along East Side Drive. So a couple of things here. There's currently only a flagger on South Curtisville. We don't actually have flaggers on Portsmouth Street or on East Side Drive. I will tell you, as an adult, it makes me nervous walking along those streets. I've canvassed in that neighborhood. It is dangerous. Um, and I think we also need to think about not just kids walking there, but um, we are moving this to uh, an area where we may have kids uh, walking back and forth outside of school hours. So I like the idea of the, the signal light or something on East Side Drive, but I would just really encourage us to think about not just our school time hours or school activities, but we may be encouraging some students to walk back and forth in conditions that may not, uh, that currently we need to make some improvements for safety. Um, the actual car buffer time, I would say is probably 30 minutes because if you have families, school gets out at 2.30 for Millbrook and Broken Ground, by the time the campus is cleared, it's 2.45 and you probably have parents coming in at 3.15 for for the middle school. I still think there's a gap there, but just for shared knowledge, it's probably more 30 minutes than an hour because it's not in time to end time. Um, the traffic concerns uh, for the backup um, definitely go down South Curtisville currently, um, but don't necessarily go onto Portsmouth Street. But I think the bigger concern for the um, neighborhood is um, the speed of traffic in that area because people are swinging in quickly <laughs> when they're trying to get their kids to school or picking them up after. Um, and um, it's East Side Drive. It's the merge of rush hour traffic and school traffic. So um, just flagging that it, that's probably a little bit more where the area is. Um, and then I would just in, if I make sure I got all these in here. Um, the last one is, um, a plea for our buses. I think we'd actually have more ridership um, and potentially more bus drivers um, if we gave more support to our school bus staff. We have limits on classroom sizes and how many staff we have allocated. And then we put one bus driver in to be in charge of 30 to 50 kids while driving in traffic and making sure every kid gets off at their stop and managing all of the social emotional, uh, you know, end of school day learning that's going, or uh, debrief that's going on. And I know that um, some families pick up their kids um, purely because of that dynamic. So um, just a plea, our bus drivers are great. We love our bus drivers, um, but we don't provide the support that they need um, and encourage families to ride the bus. Thank you. Thank you. You'll send those to me. I will. Send those Thank questions. you. Thank you for that compliment, and uh, I let the drivers know that some somebody thinks they're amazing. Yeah. 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 They're amazing. We we lost our uh, bus driver who was a former um, ambulance driver. I would say that made me really nervous the first or really uh, less nervous the first time my kid went on the bus. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was like a second person or something. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. 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 So with respect to that, and I will at this point say that for anyone who would be watching this at all, is that if you do have questions that you want to, uh, to bring before this committee, please send them to the superintendent, um, and she will make sure that everyone on the committee uh, 
is alerted and that the, the appropriate people uh, have an opportunity to review the questions. So um, appreciate the public's input on that. Uh, I will reiterate and say that I personally also think the bus drivers are really awesome <laughs> from the school board point of view. I'm not really allowed to speak for the whole board, but from one board member anyway, the bus drivers do a great job. So uh, does any, do we have anything else other than this tonight? No, does sir. anybody on the committee have any questions or anything? All right, I um, want to thank you all for putting up with me, uh, coming in here at the last minute thank to you, facilitate Jim. this. Thank um, you, thank you. And uh, Sarah will be back, I'm sure, at the next meeting. She will. Thanks, everyone. That's it, I guess. Thank you.